the network. What's going on? It's your man, Kobe. Welcome to the Digital Dash. I'll be giving you guys tips on how to market your songs and get those numbers booming. Now, today, as you can see, I have two guests with me, my guy Jason and my guy Rucker. These two guys are data nerds like myself. Um, they happen to work for a very wonderful company, Chart Metrics, something that we actually use on our side with our clients and stuff. And they've actually written a couple of articles that have kept me up late at night as researching different things I'll talk about. So I figured, you know, why not get them on here so they can break down some of these ideas and theories themselves to you guys. So with that being said, appreciate you again for joining me, guys. Yeah, man. Yeah, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us, Corey. Yeah, man, no doubt. So um, just before we get into some of the general topics, I know you guys are much bigger than your jobs and your roles at Chart Metrics. So if you can, give our audience a little background about you, yourself. What got you interested in some of the things that you're interested in today? And how did you get into the positions that you guys are in now? Oh, me first? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, uh, so I've been playing music since I was like eight, I mm. think. Um, I took a little break from that to go to college, um, studied poetry there and neuroscience. And then I graduated and I was like, well, shoot, might as well play music again. Um, so I did that for a while, like touring and, you know, playing shows and all that, that, you know, indie music life, essentially. Um, and then uh, I wanted to get into the, because as a, you can't really be an artist these days without knowing some part of the business, without mm. being some part of the business. Um, so I wanted to become as knowledgeable as I could. So um, then I, I enrolled in a master's program uh, at NYU for music business, music technology. Okay. Um, and through that, I met Jason and started working for Chart Metric doing digital marketing, digital strategy stuff. Okay. Last year. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Dope. Dope. What about you, man? Um, and then for me, uh, before Chart Metric, uh, my main work experience was actually in the military. I was a I was a cryptology officer in the U.S. Navy. So that was a really cool job, but I. I really, you know, I mean, the job was basically taking lots of disparate data and then trying to make sense of it. You know, what actions, you know, can we take from it? What are the things to, to pull away? And that is like the general skill set I still kind of still really use uh, in the music industry now. Um, so it's for me, after I left uh, the Navy, it was a matter of joining that mindset with the thing that I was very passionate about, which has always been music in my life. I played piano as a kid and um, I'm old enough to have been into the grunge era. <laughs> um, so um, that, you know, I play guitar, I was in bands too, and I still make music to this day. And, okay. and I, I approach the business side from the heart of a, a creative person. And so I think uh, having those two mindsets uh, helps me do what I do here. And, you know, it's been just really fun working with Rucker here in New York. Okay, yeah, that's dope, man. Um, yeah, Rucker, you specifically, I, mean, I didn't, I wasn't aware that you were an artist before this. Was it was it easy for you to start kind of getting into the the more analytical stuff coming? I, I guess I'm, I'm trying to think of the question I'm trying to ask. Like, because we have artists all the time who they want to dip into the analytical side, but sure. they find it difficult or they're just not used to breaking through those things. Was it a difficult process for you to start to get into the, the back end number side? Um, for me, I in college, I was um, like a research assistant for um, like I was running neuroscience experiments and stuff. So I had a background in it a little bit, um, but it really came from, you know, how do I promote my music? How do I leverage based on the fact that I don't have, you know, major label support. So how do I leverage my own power to get my music out there? And, you know, data was really the way to do that. Um, okay. So it's, largely self-taught through just through being in the industry and trying to promote my own music. Okay. Okay. That's dope, man. Um, so let's dive into chart metric then. So like I said, it's something that we're very familiar with on our side. We use it a pretty good amount. Um, but for those out there who aren't familiar with chart metric, who don't know what it is, can you guys explain to them what exactly it is, kind of the mission of it, and then some of the things that you guys actually help artists do? Yeah. Um, so chart metrics, vision is 
like we want to free up creative people to do what they do best which is write songs which is you know make tracks which is mm -hmm. go out and tour and play shows um and we approach that from the perspective of a tech company so okay. you know we're a small team uh we've been growing a lot but we're still only like 12 people it's nothing compared to like some of these massive labels that um yeah we, we are honored to have as some of our customers but you know it's kind of we we approach it from a data perspective because in 2020 we're in this world where you have all your social media platforms you have all your digital streaming platforms um and whatever else that you might be interested in like for example like we collect data from how many wikipedia views you might have or how many hits you know if you've got some songs on genius you know because mm -hmm. people are really interested in your lyrics like we include that stuff too so there's just so many areas where like numbers are now a very native part of your career as an artist just like Burkert was saying earlier so we act as kind of an intermediary between all those kind of like streams of data that are coming from different places and putting it in one dashboard. You can access from your laptop and your phone. And we try to make sense of it um, for you as an artist or for you as a manager, for you as a label, for you as a lot of other different people that are um, involved um, with our product. And uh, what I mean by that is, so not only do we have computer engineers that do a lot of the collecting and the cleaning and the organizing of data, because we can get into that later, but a lot of time it's a huge mess. We spend a lot of time trying to organize it and make it uh, simple and easy to understand through like these visualizations. Um, but we also use data science techniques, which I know is a huge buzzword nowadays, but kind of one of our value added is, you know, if you have 20 different uh, data streams, it's, you know, you can look at each one of them separately, but what if we put them together? You know, what if you just want to get an idea of how popular you are um, mm -hmm. compared to other artists? Um, that's a hard thing to kind of put into a concrete number or a concrete, yeah. you know, comparison with other artists that maybe are in your same genre. So we use data science techniques because that field allows us to like synthesize a lot of this random information that can be is really just noise when you just look at it on like you know 20 different google sheet tabs um <laughs> it's just noise it's just a bunch of yeah. stuff that the human brain just can't make sense of it but we use a lot of these data science techniques to try to just kind of condense it down to something just like that's really easy to understand in like a ranking for example yeah okay okay so it's because that's that's kind of the thing that i've, I've always liked about trimetric is it seems to be making um like definitely the data side, the data driven side of the music industry, a lot more viable to people who would have never even thought to really get into data driven marketing, which um, I, like I said, thank you guys for that because that opened up a lot. Just, I, I think it's, it's helping to make the industry a little bit more transparent, especially yeah. in the world now where everyone is so numbers driven and we're always inflating numbers, it helps to have something <laughs> to go like, all right, man, here's some measurable metrics that you can look at outside of just a high follow account or whatever to determine if something's yeah. worth it to move yeah. into. So um, moving on to, like I said, I want to get into a, a couple of specific things that you guys have talked about. Um, once again, for you guys watching, they are also contributors to the Chartmetric blog. Y'all have written like that dozens of topics that I personally um, just tapped into just to kind of explain things that I always thought, but there was never any like, I would never had, was able to touch any hard data to prove it or just like concepts and theories that I've even heard other marketers talk about, but like I said, they didn't have the data and the numbers that you guys have to look at. So one specifically that inspired a recent video of mine um i did a video talking to artists about just the benefits of marketing themselves to audiences outside of the u.s alone and that video was inspired by an article from you guys site um about trigger cities so can you touch on exactly what trigger cities are maybe even a few of them and yeah just how artists can benefit from looking at those places as, as uh, potential fan markets absolutely so um Trigger Cities is a concept that was coined by our chief commercial officer. Uh, his name is Chaz Jenkins. He's a British music executive and uh, his background is global marketing. And right. he, he's been kind of in the business for um, at least a couple decades now, maybe even more. He started out as a club owner. So he has a very kind of 360 view of the business and via his kind of specialty was always looking at the world and how it consumed music in different ways. And he found that because of, you know, once YouTube came out in like, what, 2005? What was that? Yeah. And then the oh. DSPs eventually came out um, a little bit afterwards. Mm. Uh, it, it kind of, it, it was like, the second you hit upload, like, you're instantly global. At least yeah. the, 
your the ability for someone um, halfway around the, around the world to to consume your video or you know your vlog you know whatever it is you put out as an artist and it just it's a completely different mindset and mm -hmm. the idea of trigger city is that there are several cities throughout the world that because of the streaming kind of new paradigm whatever you want to call it they are starting to at least the assumption is they're starting to influence or at least have a significant weight on how these platforms uh how they measure consumption because before for example like in the traditional you know american music industry or i i, I should say western english speaking uh, industry it was about new york it was about chicago it was about atlanta it was about you know london you know a lot of the kind of like big traditional cities that were considered like the epicenters of like culture and entertainment mm -hmm. and those were the tastemakers but with the idea of trigger cities is now we're looking at like sao paulo in Brazil, we're looking at Lima, um, Peru, we're looking at Jakarta, Indonesia, uh, uh, Bangkok, Thailand, huge, uh, huge cities with um, crazy population counts that now because we've kind of leapfrogged, you know, the desktop, you know, laptop era into like the mobile phone era where everyone's got one. And in a lot of these markets, uh, data is actually quite cheap and they can stream as much as they want. And so, for example, one of the uh, kind of like analyses we did was we looked at like YouTube view counts um, for artists in like a one month period. And uh, the top 10 cities were, I think, mostly from like India and like Southeast Asia. Um, yeah. And nowhere like New York was like the first like, you know, Western city. And that was like maybe in like the high teens. You know what I mean? So it was like it really put things in perspective in terms of you know, you have these huge populations that weren't considered, you know, traditional kind of like movers and shakers in the global mm -hmm. entertainment industry. But now because, you know, streaming has like liberated like whatever kind of like local market kind of business dynamics that just kept things limited to like, you know, if you were living in the UK, it was all about London or if you're living in, yeah. you know, wherever, it was all about the major cities. It's kind of like allowed these cities that, you know, were kind of always, they all have their own like huge music histories themselves, but they were just kind of put in their little box because yeah. like the, the way the business infrastructure was set up was it just kept all these people separate. So we wrote a series of three articles, a mini series talking about Southeast Asia and we talked about Latin America. And then we had a third one talking about kind of like both. And just talking about how, you know, if you're an artist today and you're putting out music, um, you know, you're doing an Instagram campaign or, you know, you're doing something on TikTok or whatever, that you should at least have this as, uh, like, this is the new world we live in. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think it's worth saying too, uh, that you shouldn't try to market, at least I wouldn't think, you would want to market to like everything. Yeah. yeah. But the menu is just bigger now. You know, right. you just never know, like this data thing, you know, we're really just, I like to think of, we're just measuring like love, like yeah. what love, like where's the love from your fans coming from? And where are the fans that you don't even know that you could have coming from? Like you could put yeah. out a track and for whatever reason, it's like resonating in like, I don't know, uh, you know, you put out a love song and it's like really huge in like, like Manila in the Philippines yeah. and you, you don't probably couldn't even point to it on a map. Um, <laughs> but you're like, oh my God, like they really love like this, this ballad I just put out. Um, maybe I should pay attention to them and, you know, focus my, you know, my next social media campaign towards that city. Um, that's kind of the power of the data um, and the idea of trigger cities that we try to um, at least just shed some light on so people can think about kind of the way they distribute themselves in a new way. Yeah, and it correlates, like you said, how global, um, like the music industry really has become out the gate where we used to feel like, oh, we need, an expensive booking agent or, you know, a couple thousand dollars on a plane ticket to get to, get to these fans and these other countries when like, no, actually it becomes, um, from my experience, it's a little bit cheaper to even target some of these markets. So that was kind of the things that was interesting to me is like, Jakarta is a really huge city on that list, but advertising costs at Jakarta are literally like pennies on the dollar. So it means <laughs> that you can get in front of a larger fan base for literally a fraction of the cost of what it would take to get in front of a fraction of those people in the U.S. Right, um, so I think it, I think it does tie into a lot of that. So would you recommend that, is it something that you would recommend an artist who is building a fan base out to gate to look into pushing themselves to these places? Or do you see it as something to look at maybe once they kind of collect a little bit more data about the fans around them to then start looking into these markets? 
Yeah. Um, so, I mean, a, a part of the, the, this, this mini series that we wrote about um, Trigger Cities was actually getting into like, what were the local music tastes? Mm. Um, and I think that part's really important because at the same time, while we're talking about these huge streaming numbers coming from these, you know, these cities, it shouldn't just be a numbers game. Like it should be more like get to know them for like what the thing, like what are they listening to? And if it happens to align with whatever you make as an artist, then I think it's an opportunity. Yeah. Um, I, I think the wrong way to go about it, personally speaking, is, oh, sweet. There's a bunch of people in Rio de Janeiro. Like, let me try to yeah. just like get some numbers in Rio de Janeiro, even though it has nothing to do with like the kind of music you make. I just think, yeah. I think that's the wrong way to go about it. Uh, I think it's more about, let me learn a little bit about, you know, oh, rock is really big in like Rio de Janeiro. Like, you know, Rock and Rio is like this huge festival that's going on for a long time. And um, it's got other kinds of music there too, but um, rock is really big in not only Brazil, but other parts of Latin America. You know, if you happen to be, you know, uh, you know you've got a band and you, you guys do rock music, like that's obviously a region you should, you know, look into because there's just for some whatever reason, for cultural reasons that are beyond my knowledge right now, I'm sure there are a lot of historians that could talk more about it, but it just, it's just a popular genre there. And then I mentioned yeah. Manila before, like in Southeast Asia, like, for whatever reason, um, I, I, so I'm actually Filipino American. I, I came back from there uh, not too long ago, uh, and they just really love just like I won't say cheesy, but just like really just like earnest kind of hard on your sleeve like love songs. I just love it. Like we love singing stuff like that, you know, with nice melodies and there's no swearing and it's just like super just like you know um, really like easygoing love songs like that. That crowd just loves that. So if that aligns with your music, and I think it's worth doing. Um, I think I might have talked myself in a circle. I forget now at this point. <laughs> yeah, I think it's just about, about um, you get as much as things are global, you also have to think locally or regionally yeah. um, and be sensitive to those, those differences, really. But also, it, it depends on your goals. Um, what it really has opened the door for is like a more targeted, like niche approach to, mm -hmm. to building your career as an artist really you don't have to be this huge you know superstar yeah. that's known around the world you just yeah. you know appeal to to those who actually care about your music and where there's a market no matter where you are yeah yeah no matter where you are that's, that's interesting we have a we have a client we were working with recently and he dropped the song maybe three weeks ago and he had never been picked up by an editorial playlist um his songs always did really decent but with this song drop for whatever reason, we still aren't privy on to why, but he got picked up by a bunch of New Music Friday playlists in like mm. India, Malaysia, yeah, yeah. all of these like, uh, these Southeastern Asian countries and it skyrocketed his song. Like he literally grew like 900 to 1,000 followers over the last couple of weeks. Right. And even wow. we were talking, then, yeah, it's like, it was crazy, man. It was, it was wow, the song went from maybe 20K to 100K over those like last two weeks, 1,000 plus followers all off of those markets, even his related artists in the regions that are showing up on, on his stats are starting to change based on it. And the right. thing he was asking is like, what do I do next? And I'm like, well, man, you know, luckily for you, a lot of these countries are not expensive to target to. Like you could probably get in front of a good majority of these people for the budget that you have um, to work with. So we've always kind of approached it with data collection in mind is if you don't have thousands and thousands of dollars to build out um, you know, potential audience or at least collect data on how to find your potential audience in the U.S., you can easily run a $200 ad to some of these other countries and still collect really valuable data that can still help you make those decisions. Mm -hmm. um, that's kind of, and even, I know we have a, um, my friend manages an artist by the name of Naya Bricks, and she has a huge fan base in Japan just because she mm -hmm. got placed on to this anime. She's the singing vocal for this anime. Um, I can't think of the name off the top of my head, but just seeing what having access to that type of audience versus yes. like, you know, she has a fan base here in Atlanta, but it's, it's a complete difference. Like she has a really solidified fan base there. And I've been trying to use those as a great examples for artists who look at taking a more global approach. Cause I think a lot of the artists here tend to look at it like, if they're not popular around the people that they can touch or get to, then they don't feel popular. But I always look at it like, they right. spend money the same, they stream the same, you know what I'm saying? They love you just the same. So these are all still viable places to, to dip into. So, man, so that's, um, yeah, that's really dope. So are, are there any on that list of those trigger cities that like stand out to you as just, I don't know, maybe being the hubs of where 
maybe um, a good majority of artists have popped their careers off but seem to be like markets where, um, well, I, let me tie it back. So I've kind of noticed one of the trends of major labels seems to be when they sign a new act, they'll build them up internationally, take them to these markets uh, through whatever connections they have for tours, and then use that, ex well, not experience, but use those, I guess, resources gained from the tour to come back and kind of build them out in the U.S. So there are, are there any markets that you've seen have been like good places for, um, I know you said it's a, it's a lot, it's mostly based on the genre of music and the culture of the area, but are there any specific regions you have seen to be just a good place for maybe really any artist to start looking to trying to build in? Well, for example, um, Mexico City is like one of the biggest, you know, streaming cities in the world, really, mm. on, on the whole. Um, but I, there's a big market there for like rock and indie rock. Um, mm. So you, you do have to think um, sort of in a targeted way, like it, it's, it's not like, um, you know, a huge sort of like pop artist is necessarily going to pop off in the same way in Mexico City as they will in another city. So I think you do have to still think about it in, in a targeted way, but Mexico City is, is a good example where the streaming numbers are insane. And so if you're like an indie rock artist, for example, who is struggling in, you know, America, for example, that might be an option to look at. And I know Jason has looked at some Southeast Asian um, countries and like pop artists that have popped off there as well. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. Um, and to add to that, I like one of the other kind of like analyses we kind of ran for this Trigger City series was like Shazam chart occurrences. Okay. So we would look at like these cities because we, we have them, uh, Shazam puts out these charts at the city level. So um, it allowed us uh, to like localize basically like what are people in various cities pulling their phone out to Shazam and essentially using that as like a, a, a way to kind of get an idea of like what are the sounds that the city is interested in. Mm. Um, and you know so if you're a hip hop artist, like maybe you don't, maybe you don't, but like Paris like loves hip hop. Like, yeah, yeah. like Paris is just like a huge like hip hop um, kind of like fan. There's a huge fan base there. You know, uh, I think it was in Berlin. They're super into like a lot of electronic music. Yeah. Like like electronic cl like music clubs are like huge in Berlin. Like, you know, like they're it really just. I mean, if you, you probably know it if that's already your genre, but it just gives yeah. you some more confirmation and a lot of times, uh, you know, some surprise to, to understand like where your stuff could actually take off in. Yeah. Um, but I think it's important to remind people that like, just like Rucker said, it really just depends on your goals. Like mm. maybe you just want to be big in your state, you know, like yeah. there's nothing wrong with that. Like what if you got a family, you don't want to be touring the world. And like, you just like, <laughs> you just want to like have fun, like on the weekends, play a few shows here and there. And, and that's like total respect. Like that's like totally cool. Um, but you know, it, maybe you want to make it a little side income, you know, from streaming dollars, you know, from you know some of these cities that are abroad, and you don't necessarily yeah. want to tour there. So, um, I think that's that's all that stuff is is totally worth thinking about because it's all in the context of your goals. Because not everybody can or even wants to be, you know, Drake or Beyonce or yeah. Ariana Grande. You know what I mean? It's just not. There's only room for so much of that um, in in pop culture. So um, it really just depends on what you want to do with it. Okay, yeah, dope. I completely agree, man. Yeah. Um, so moving into, I want to get into playlisting a little bit just because that's a that's originally what attracted me to chart metric was. Mm -hmm. uh, it used to be that uh, using chart metrics kind of like uh, to look at the growth history of a playlist. I see now that you guys have, or have been offering for a while, the estimated um, percentage of listeners of the playlist that are actually like engaged on the playlist. So recently Spotify has removed the ability to see the listener count for a certain playlist on what well, I'm not gonna say sorry, but I think it's all playlists at this point, but be able to yeah. see the listener count for playlists. Um, and that's kind of impacted one of the main strategies I think a lot of indie artists were using was using that to gauge how effective a playlist would be and also using it to gauge if the playlist will actually be, um, if it's a scam playlist or not. So yeah. uh, mm -hmm. what are some of the, the back end numbers that you guys look at on the chart metric side to determine if a playlist is even worth 
investing their time into. Um, do you know, by the way, if that's happening on the artists, like like Spotify for artists back end? No, they can still see it. They can still see it on the back okay. end, but you can't see it on, yeah, on the front end anymore. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, just to, to, to elaborate a little bit more on what uh, you're mentioning in terms of what we measure. So we basically have this way of um, gathering the amount of monthly listeners you essentially get, um, potentially could get from a playlist. Um, mm -hmm. So essentially, you know, you open up your Spotify app and you go to the about section and it used to be before the recent updates, yeah. you could see like the top five playlists that that particular artist um, um, got in terms of like the monthly listeners. So essentially in the past 28 days, which is what um, Spotify, you know, calls, you know, a month um, and running because it always stays kind of like up to date. How many different people streamed this artist on that playlist at least once? Okay. is basically how, how we understood it. And so you'd see a count and you'd see these top five playlists. And so essentially what we could kind of do is kind of like be able to collect that and then we can accept now sort it instead of the artist, just focus on the playlist. And then we can look at a bunch of different artists and we can understand now, you know, what is the range of monthly listeners that, you know, you could potentially get as an artist looking at all these other artists. And, you know, it was useful uh, for a lot of our users to be able to kind of gauge um, engagement for a particular yeah. playlist and give some kind of like rough estimate of, you know, expectation, right? Because just because a playlist has a certain amount of followers doesn't necessarily mean that um, it, it's always getting listens. Um, yeah. There's an article that uh, Rolling Stone put out, um, I think it was like maybe late last year, about how there are a couple of Spotify playlists. I think it was comparing uh, Pollen and, um, oh, what's one of the, what was one of the top Spotify R&B uh, playlists? I can't think about the top of my head. It's not R&B. It's not just R&B. I think it might be like alt R&B or like something like that. But it, it actually, so essentially it was comparing like, it, they're both playlists that had music that worked basically in the alternative R&B genre. But one had more followers, and I know Pollen had less followers, but there was much more engagement on Pollen. Yeah. Right? So, you know, so it's it's such a great uh, article because it really talks about, like, you know, you can follow a playlist. You know, today's top hits on Spotify is, like, by far and away the number one most followed playlist. Um, yeah. But at the end of the day, it's also just, like, a one-time act from the user perspective. You know, yeah. I see a playlist. Oh, cool. I jammed on it for like, you know, half an hour. I'm going to click follow. But what if I never really go back? You know, what if I just forgot yeah. about it? What if I just, what if for whatever reason, I just never click on it? That follow count still stays. And so it looks good for the playlist. But when it comes to actual engagement, um, I'm actually going to this pollen playlist because I always know, like the curation on the playlist is like sick. I'm yeah. always learning about new artists on there. It's always got this vibe that I always uh, dig. Um, Maybe I just like it. So I've I've even forgotten to click follow on it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. you know, it's just this is the kind of area where data can be really useful if you take the time to really understand what these numbers mean. Mm -hmm. You know, YouTube view does not equal a Spotify spin. Does not equal a spin on the radio. You know, they all say one, but they all mean different things. You know what yeah. I mean? It depends on how people are coming across that particular view or spin or listen or whatever. Um, so I think if when people take the time to really understand um, the meaning of each number and what it means in your career, I think that's when you start to really get some more value out of a tool like Chartmetric or, you know, honestly, even outside of Chartmetric, there are a lot of other really useful tools that, you know, you can, as long as you just take time to think about what it's measuring and what it means to your audience, I think that's kind of where the real value is. Yeah, and I think that, I think that goes to like the fake, spotting fake playlists or fake streams or profiles or whatever is is understanding that it's not a single metric it's the relationship between those metrics like how are the followers relating to the monthly listeners if the monthly listeners are crazy high but the follower count is crazy low then something's up yeah if yeah. it's vice versa something is up there too um yeah. it's it's the relationship in which um they're playing and they're growing really um, that matters, that allows you to tell, like, is this legit? Is this going to do something for me? Yeah, a lot of it's also just kind of like sinking your teeth into knowing what numbers I understand. Knowing, like you said, looking like, ah, oh, this place is getting 
ten thousand listens a month, but they have three followers. Like, what's, sure. what's going yeah. on? <laughs> right. Like, what's, what's our? We've seen cases of um, which I'm not. I'm always never sure if it's because followers lost interest in the playlist or if they just were using like body methods or something. But we've seen playlists with hundred thousand followers that only get like a couple hundred listens to it. Like, I, right. I think yeah, you're right. Like, it's, it's being able to just identify what those red flags look like from a data standpoint before you just mm -hmm. jump at a playlist because they have good front end numbers. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So um another thing that I've always thought was interesting about playlisting in general was that um user generated playlists outnumber the amount of official playlists on Spotify. Like they have a very um they're what one of the maybe the only streaming platform with that heavy of a user generated playlist community. I don't think Apple doesn't really have a, u a huge user generated players. I know these are, the rest of them really don't. And I know yeah, Rucker, yeah. you you wrote an article talking about um, just breaking down, um, breaking down some of the more popular independent curators on Spotify. Uh, so can you speak to one, um, I guess being able as an artist to utilize these different indie curators before trying to jump to some of these major playlists and then one, what have been some of the best ways that you've seen to kind of like find these these actual like really powerful independent curators? The ones who are actually competing, because I've seen like some of them actually compete with the major Spotify playlists, or they get more listens right. than some of the major Spotify playlists. Yeah, so what I really wanted to do with that article is like sort of break down sort of tiers of, of these playlists and curators and to have people like go explore themselves what a lot of people don't realize is, so we have a filter where you can exclude um, Spotify or major label brands. Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of people don't realize that outside of Spotify editorials, which are obviously huge because yeah. they're Spotify, there's um, three major label um, curators as well. Um, and those are uh, Filter, Digster, and Topsify. So those are all owned by major labels. So they're not really independent curators. So it's important to know that, first of all, because mm -hmm. if you're pitching to them, you know, probably not the best avenue to go down. Yeah. <laughs> um, so we have a filter where you can exclude, you know, Spotify and major label brands. And you can look at, you know, the truly like independent curators and um, see how many playlist followers they have, um, 28 day change ratio mm -hmm. uh, or percentage change in those followers. Um, so you can really filter what tier of independent playlist is right for you. Because just because it's independent doesn't necessarily mean it's the right one to go for. Because yeah. if it's huge, you're still not going to get through if you're just starting out, you know? Yeah. Um, so it's really up to you to, to again, it goes back to setting your goals and knowing where you're at in relation to your goal. Um, it's up to you to, to do that sort of self filtering and be real realistic about like, Hey, I can target this smaller playlist and that might lead me to this bigger playlist. And we, ha we actually have a feature called playlist journeys where you can see, um, the essentially the, the, the journeys that tracks take through playlists. So you can sort of see what playlists feed into what other playlists. Um, so what smaller playlist the song started on to get it to a bigger and bigger playlist. Uh, but it is really on, on you to interpret or your team to interpret, to interpret that for you, for your goals. It's not just going to happen automatically. I okay. think it's the uh, difficult part. Are you able to tell from your side? Um, Cause I, like I said, I think it's, I think it's interesting that there are indie curators whose playlist network rival the major playlists. So are, are you able to see any trends in like playlist growth? Like maybe specific things that the curators are doing to grow their playlist that large? Hmm. Have you noticed anything? Um, like in terms of like the track selection and like how they, well, maybe not even that, more so like growth tactics. Like we, we interviewed a playlist curator on here once and he was telling us one of his big strategies was he would change the name of his playlist to a popular album. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, yeah. yeah, that's, I mean, that's one thing you can do is like 
search yeah. engine optimization. So like, yeah. Yeah. I've noticed that with, and this is not like the most ethical thing, but like some playlists will literally copy a bigger playlist, like word for word. Yeah. And so they get the search engine optimization from those, from that, from yeah. the association with that bigger legit playlist. So that's like a unethical way that some people do it, uh, yeah. which I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, recommend. Uh, so that's another thing to look out for though, you know, cause you could be looking for new music Friday and it's not actually new music Friday. Yeah. It's this other new music Friday. New okay. music Friday asterisk. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh, what was that? Uh, soundtrack was for Euphoria. Yeah, it was like the, for that the HBO, HBO series show. with Zendaya. Yeah, yeah. Um, a really popular show has a really like cult following to it, and uh, there's the official soundtrack on Spotify has like you know X amount of followers, but like th this other one from like a third party curator that is also titled Euphoria, whatever, whatever, has like at least like with like two X like followers, if not. Yeah, more. yeah, it's like outstripped the actual playlist. Um, that said. So like plagiarism, not cool, but <laughs> there, there are like, you know, strategic keyword things you can do. Um, yeah. You know, if you know like what people are searching for, what they're into, that's part of what being a curator is, is just yeah. knowing what people are into, what their, um, what their tastes are, what they're um, going to be interested in. That's just an extension of what the curator is, really, as long as yeah. it's not plagiarism. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think it probably whatever, whatever like uh, engagement tactics a curator does within a DSP is probably fairly limited, I would say, yeah. outside of that kind of SEO type stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think probably, if anything, what they can do uh, more for themselves as a curator is probably outside of it. Mm. Um, whether it be social media, yeah, definitely um, appearances at like music conferences, you know, putting out you know a free PDF, you know, book about you know dope music and like taste and stuff like that. Like, there's I think every, anything they can do together, following outside of DSPs themselves, is probably a better use of their time. But yeah, that's definitely not my field of expertise. I know that much. Yeah, and, but and you know when it comes down to it, knowing good music. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's yeah. that's. Yeah. Step one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's the, that's the other thing is because I've noticed that's one really popular indie curator. I noticed they always get to like all of the big movie releases and make playlists. Right. Like, yep. Months before, like it literally seems like the moment they announce that it's even in works, yeah. there's a playlist made for it. It's, it's always crazy. Um, yeah. Okay. Right, cool. So, so um, going back to, um, I think there was an article I read about um, just kind of looking at a lot of like cross-platform activity. And then using it almost as like a like a mock A and R type of thing to be able to just uh, not I don't want to say guess, but be able to make like educated guesses on where artists is going if they're kind of pushing themselves the right way. So um, I don't remember which which one of you wrote it, uh, so my bad about that. But can you speak a little bit more on using like cross platform data to for um, artists to be able to I guess determine one if their marketing strategies are working, and then two. I guess for being able to identify maybe like other possible opportunities that they didn't see or didn't know about before. Mm. Um, so this might be in reference to an article that I wrote recently um, with our data scientist, Josh. Um, so this sort of goes back to the relationship between different metrics. Mm. We, we looked at, um, you know, patterns of early growth essentially for artists mm -hmm. and we were just you know giving a snapshot of different possibilities for trends you might see um so like one was was just straight growth uh, across mm -hmm. all platforms obviously that's a good sign if it's you know healthy solid growth across all platforms that's you're doing something right and you should continue that momentum um there was another one that was the monthly listeners were just through the roof, but the followers were not keeping up with that. Yeah. And we looked at why that was, and it was someone who had been added to a bunch of like classical concentration playlists because it was really like pleasant piano music. Yeah. Um, so for him or for that artist, 
maybe their goal isn't to be a touring artist. Maybe they just want to land on these um, playlists and get some residual income from that. And they are totally succeeding in that regard. Um, yeah. but, but understanding the relationship between how those uh, trend lines, how those different metrics, um, how they relate to each other and how they grow together or not grow together yeah. will tell you something about um, either w something that has worked for you or something that you should continue to um, or shoot for, I guess. Yeah, yeah. I, I thought it was interesting in that because I remember the example of the guy he had about what, like 1.2 million listeners off a of playlist and his growth count didn't didn't really go up. So the, yeah. All right. Are there any theories as to why maybe that was? Was it maybe like the, the wrong selection of playlists that he was in, or just I think a profile it's, optimization thing? Yeah, I think he's just like he's not. It wasn't like an artist profile, you know. People yeah. were just just listening passively to the these yeah. very pleasant songs, which is totally fine. Um, you know, there's no right way to do music or to grow yeah. yourself as a musician, really. Um, some people grow themselves as a brand. Mm -hmm. um, some people grow themselves as like a functional use of their music, like mm -hmm. to help relax people or whatever. Yeah. There's no right avenue to go down. It's just knowing what your goals are and um, knowing how to um, understand your data to achieve those goals. I yeah. Think. Okay. Yeah. Have you guys noticed um, if other platforms tend to pay attention to how artists are moving on one platform? Does that, does that, do you see that effect? Like for instance, if a, if an artist song is, let's say going viral on Spotify, is there usually a correlation between like the Apple numbers going up or maybe the search for it going up on YouTube? Have you, have you guys noticed things like that on the back end? Or is it, or is it, or is it, cause I, I, it feels like a vague question now saying it out loud because I've, I've seen isolated incidents where we've, encounter artists who do crazy on Spotify. Sure. The song is in hundreds of thousands, crossing millions, but then their Apple monthly listeners aren't necessarily the same. But then we've also seen, uh, we've had clients before, where we'll see them get picked up by editorial playlists or major playlists on Spotify, and then like days later, Apple Music has picked them up on mm -hmm. another playlist as well. So I was just wondering if, if you guys had, does, have you seen anything in the back end to kind of like correlate with that? Hmm. I mean, short answer is no, I, but but it's not, it's 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 because we actually haven't looked. I mean, I think yeah. that's a really cool thing for you to bring up. Yes, yeah, yeah. Honestly, Definitely. just we haven't even thought about that. Yeah. Um, I think it makes sense that the curators at Apple or Spotify or whatever DSP are thinking of, they, they're obviously looking at each other. I mean, yeah. <laughs> you know, Nike and Reebok and Adidas, they're always looking at what what each other what each other are doing on the shoe, like so. It just makes sense that they're paying attention to each other, and so if someone catches on to a new artist and they're, they're is doing well on you know streaming platform A, then streaming platform B is probably going to try to get a, a piece of that because mm -hmm. you know if 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 like the general streaming audience is really digging an artist and they're not onto it yet, that's yeah. I mean it's just a classic you know no please listen to that person on us uh, with yeah. us, yeah. Um, so that makes sense on kind of like a competitive level. Um, but that, that feature that Rutger mentioned earlier, this playlist journeys, things that we have, uh, we only do it right now within each DSP. So okay. we look at the, play, the, the way Spotify playlists relate to other Spotify playlists and also that with Apple Music. Mm -hmm. But um, we could totally yeah. do it That'd from really cool, in, in between uh, <laughs> streaming platforms. Um, yeah. It would be a hell of a calculation and it would take yeah. a lot of computing power. But <laughs> I think, I think we, it, it's, it's possible. Yeah. I mean, that said, um, we came out with the, so Jason and I write, um, I mean, we have another one in the works, but we read these semi-annual reports and um, the last one we did, uh, we looked at the top 30 playlists across four um, DSPs mm -hmm. and we did sort of like a genre, uh, artist genre and artist geography distribution. And there were some differences in terms of like what genres tend to do better or are added more to the top mm -hmm. playlists. Um, so there is, there are some differences. Um, 
obviously I, I don't know how dynamic that is in terms of like how often that changes, but right. Amazon, you know, is known for being really big for country artists. Yeah. Um, so, and like Deezer is, I mean, what we discovered through our data analysis is like really big for like Latin and Caribbean um, genres. So there is in a more macro sense, um, you can think about it that way as well. But like, like there are platforms that the audiences for certain genres of music do tend to migrate to these platforms a lot more. Because I even know it's like, it seems like rap and pop dominate Spotify, but I have noticed the Caribbean yeah. music, like Afrobeats, that type of stuff seems to dominate these are platforms. That's yeah. interesting. Oh, okay. Okay. I that's mean, cool. that's that's what our our analysis suggested that. Yeah. Um, I don't know that we could we could say like definitively, like this audience base is more this, but in terms of what genres were added to the top playlists, if you take that as an indication of that, okay, then yes, yeah, okay, yeah, okay. Also okay. worth mentioning too, like you know, after yeah. and uh oh, you still there? Okay, yeah, um, also worth mentioning too that um, you know, Apple and Spotify aren't the only you know players in the business. Oh yeah, like, yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's worth mentioning depending on the kind of music that you do. Like, like what if you're like what if you're like a Brazilian American, you know, artist, you know, and you don't even know that Deezer exists, yeah. but you grew up speaking like Brazilian Portuguese in the house and you could do it in your music, but like, ah, whatever, I'm just gonna, you know, I, I, you know, I grew up in the States and I, you know, I'm gonna sing in English. So that's cool and all, but dude, like if it's, it's, you know, small fish in a big pond, you know what I mean? Like yeah. you could try and I don't think it's, I think it's totally like a valid option, but like, it might be worth considering like why not see what i could do on this you know dsp that you know hasn't had as much mind share as spotify and, and apple you know mm -hmm. and kind of like every day but um they've got a huge international audience especially in in latin america and especially yeah. they have some really dope curators um mm -hmm. in like the brazilian space like because brazil is a whole other world unto itself and they do a really great job of localizing um, within each culture um, and have making really great playlists in that culture. So, you know, for that kind of artist, like, it might be really cool to like, let me try to like, you know, make some waves here because maybe a lot of people, not as many people are looking here and I could really, you know, do some damage. I think that's a really cool like guerrilla tactic that, you know, if you're down to do it, I think it's, it's worth looking into some of these other DSPs as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I agree. That goes back to the whole globalization of music and then, Going yeah. where there's clearly an interest, but it hasn't become oversaturated with artists kind of trying to attack it. Because I think that's that's that seems to be what happened to with Spotify. A lot of the people who were onto Spotify playlists like really early on, like years ago, like they just tell me stories all the time about how how easy it was to work really? Spotify. In fact, yeah, yeah, yeah. now that every artist knows that oh shit, I should be on Spotify, I should be working these playlists and doing these things. Right, right. right. Yeah, yeah. Which right now that's TikTok, right? Like, you know, <laughs> like the you know, a few years ago it was Instagram and if it, again if it was like two thousand six, like I'm gonna vlog on YouTube and that's like the new thing, right? Yeah. It's it's always like at every few years like a platform comes out and it's kind of like it's like the golden era where like every all the gates are open and you know, creativity is at like an apex because no one really knows what to do with it yet. Like yeah. right now, like I feel like it's just growing out of like the preteen doing cute dances on on TikTok. Like yeah, it's yeah. it's finally growing past that and people are doing other really cool things on TikTok, but like it's still very much in its like golden age. And so like it's that's a that's you know, we have TikTok charts on our platform and um it's, people are super, super interested in it. But you know, just from a bigger perspective, like it's always gonna be a new platform. So I think for artists to like really keep their minds open and to what is gaining more traction and how can I make my own personal, you know, kind of impact on it with in an original way is always going to be, uh, I think, a key thing for, for people as time goes on. Yeah. 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 Like be first, be dope. Win yeah, yeah, before everybody else realizes you can win over there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And know, know who you are. And if you know who you are and what your, what your goals are, you're gonna better be able to take those opportunities when they come. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Cool. 
Um, well, that was pretty much everything I wanted to cover with you guys, man. Like, like I said, it just was a couple of topics and things from articles I read from you guys. I wanted to, I was going to do videos on it. I was like, man, let me get people to talk about it. <laughs> actually, come and break some of this stuff down so I don't misconstrue anything. Um, sure. So, that, if there any any last, you know, data driven pieces of wisdom you would leave with our audience, just any 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 general advice that you can give, um, just based off of all of that stuff. <laughs> get anything? Um, I feel like we said most of it. Yeah, I, I mean, think we got it in. Know who you are, know who you are, know your goals. Um, seize those opportunities when they come. But also, yeah, watch those numbers. Yeah, <laughs> watch those watch numbers. numbers. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna I'm approach from different angles. Like, <laughs> hey, don't, don't like if you're a starting out as an artist, like, don't feel bad if you don't like pop off like Lil Nas X. Like, yeah, uh, yeah, you know, For like sure. from the get go, like, dude, like, it's okay, like then don't get down on yourself like it. I've, one of the things that I always try to keep conscious of because I work for a data company in, in a creative business is like, like we're, we're here to, to measure things and stuff, but like it, it, don't think that just because you don't see the numbers you want to see in the, in the outset that it, it means that your stuff is not good. Yeah. I think, I think it's so important to, as an artist to protect that part of you that's creative and sensitive and, um, you need to, if, as long as you, you know, you click upload and every time you play it, you're like, yo, that's dope. You know, and like you and your friends are like, you know, are, are really digging it, like in the car and stuff. Like at the end of the day, like that's the most important thing. And then I think if you just keep focusing on that, then the numbers will follow. But um, don't get too, um, you know, blinded by the numbers and don't get too down on yourself if you don't see the things that you want to see in the beginning, because um, I think that's not, your purpose as an artist. I think your purpose yeah. as an artist is to create, um, you know, really like just honest and fun or sad or whatever it is that you make and, and just then make it from the heart and all this data and all this business stuff, it'll come as a, but yeah. you gotta like focus on that stuff first because that's the most important thing. Um, yeah. Yeah, I'm gonna say that. Yep. And I'll also say it from a from um, from a self promotional perspective. Um, if 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 your audience is interested, um, we're happy to extend like a like a free premium trial uh, period on Trumpmetric if they want to check it out. Um, I'll put out the code uh, Brandman. Um, if that sounds good, um, they can go into the settings, create a free account, and if they want to put in Brandman into the coupon uh, code in their settings, um, they can get a free trial. And then if you're interested, um, by all means, reach out to us if you want to talk about it. Um, We'd be happy to, to talk with you. All right, but cool. And I'll link their socials in the description below so you guys can check them out, come and find them out. I'll talk to y'all and see what platform y'all want to cool. come reach out to you on. Uh, so other than that, if you feel like you learned anything today, please like and share this video. Hit those post notifications as well as I wouldn't want you guys to miss anything. Once again, my name is Corey. These have been my guests, Jason and Rugger. Appreciate y'all again for coming out. Yes, um, and I'll see y'all next time. Peace. Peace. It's the network. Thank you.